Speaking. And welcome to this week's Black Mental Health is Black Health. I'm your host, Bronwyn Lucas, and I am excited to be here tonight. We have had several technical issues tonight and my guest is not able to be on. However, as the saying goes, the show must go on. So we're going to proceed and you have me tonight um, talking about our issue and that is honoring our elders, thinking this past Sunday was Grandparents Day. And in honor of grandparents, I wanted to have my guest on who had an organization um, titled Grandparents Raising Grandchildren. I'm going to have her come back in December um, because I think it'll be just awesome to hear the wonderful things she's done and the things that she has to say. But I have some thoughts on um, honoring our elders, so we're going to talk about that. But if you've ever seen the show before, you know we must start out with some deep cleansing breaths. So if you've never been here, we start the show with taking three deep breaths together. These deep breaths allow you to uh, calm your mind, body, and spirit down. Um, they allow you to get rid of some of the cares of the day and help you focus. It's something you can do anytime, anywhere to just help you have that moment and get it back together. So I will count, I will say breathe in and slowly count to four, and I'll have you slowly breathe in to four, in. And then I'll say exhale or breathe out, and you will slowly let the air out. As slow as I count is as slow as you will breathe in and breathe out. So let's practice. Let's just do it. Breathe in, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, in, two, three, four, out, two, three, four. One more, in, two, three, four, out, two, three, four. Just a moment to just breathe and get rid of some of the stress of the day. So, <clears throat> good evening again to all those who have joined us. As I stated, my guest was unable to make it tonight because of uh, technical issues. But that's okay. I have some things to say about honoring our elders and um, grandparents and the role of grandparents. Before I get started, I wanted to look at this day in history. Um, on September 15, 1963, the 16th Street Baptist Church was bombed in Birmingham, Alabama. There was a pivotal point in um, African American history and it, it's another one of those things we should never forget. So much happened in the 60s, and so around 63 was just a lot going on that year. Um, we look, we talk about what our schools don't teach, but what do we teach? And since we're honoring our elders and honoring our grandparents, it is up to us as elders to pass on that knowledge. We may have been a little child in 63, may not have been born in 63, but if you know this knowledge, pass it on. So in just giving you about that incident, as I said, the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama, was bombed by the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, 14 people were injured and four little girls were killed. Their names were Addie Mae Collins, and she was known as an outgoing artistic girl. Denise McNair, she play, she uh, performed in plays, danced, and did po read poetry. Carol Robinson, she was a good student and she loved reading and dancing. And Cynthia, I forgot her last name, oh gosh, but she excelled in math, reading, and I think it was Cynthia Wesley. She excelled in math, reading, and band. And we know their names, but I wanted to give you one little tidbit just about them. These are four little girls who went to church. 
on a Sunday morning and were getting ready to sing in the choir. And they were in the basement of the church. And when they uh, were on their way up, the church was bombed and they were killed. It was bombed by the Klan. They chose a church for their method of hate. This is not new, what we're seeing. And it's important as we're talking about honoring our elders, um, I'm looking at two sides. It's important for the young to honor the old, and it's important for the old to teach the young. And it's a perfect day, a perfect thing to start with. As we're talking about honoring our elders, we have to honor our past, honor our history. So that was a perfect way to start off tonight, honoring our history. If you don't know about this event, study it. Look at what all went on in 1963. Look at why was um, Birmingham was known as Bombingham. That particular church, that was not the first time it had been bombed. It was bombed because they were very active in trying to get things changed in Birmingham. Uh, it was a focal point for things to happen and people to gather. So know your history, which kind of leads me into this discussion of honoring our elders, honoring our grandparents. As I said, last Sunday, uh, this past Sunday was Grandparents Day, a time to honor our grandparents, which is something that is awesome. And the person who I will have back in December has an organization, Grandparents Raising Grandchildren. And her organization was started um, when, um, as a result of her having grandchildren to raise. And so often, grandparents are raising grandchildren not because they wanted to. There are situations where, um, and we'll talk about kinship care, where the children are taken by the foster care system or where a parent is, may be on drugs, may be incarcerated, and someone has to raise the child and the grandparents come in because they want that child to still be in their family. They don't want them to be placed in the foster care system. They don't want them placed outside the home. So sometimes grandparents are raising grandchildren not because they wanted to. They want to think my job is done, is over, I'm through. And it starts all over again. Her organization supported parents in that situation. Um, lots of um, lots of challenges. And so when we look at that, what are just some of the challenges that grandparents face when raising grandchildren? You know, one of the biggest challenges, I am done. I am old. I am through. And old, not even necessarily old, old, but I'm through. I didn't want to do this again. And there is a reluctancy to take it on, but out of love they do. So the love will override, overshadow, override the reluctancy. Now, interesting thing about Texas, if a child is in the foster care system and someone has to raise them outside of the family, they're gonna get a check. If a parent, a family member takes it, it's called kinship care. The kid, the at first, it was no money for kinship care. Now, when I looked up, um, when I looked up the amount of money that a person gets if they're in kinship care, it is twelve dollars and sixty cents a day to take care of a child. Twelve dollars and sixty cent a day comes to three hundred and eighty dollars and ten cents. Whereas if you were uh, foster care payments, now it says start at $800. So when you think about it, shouldn't the, the grandparent who is raising this child have the same <clears throat> allotment as a, someone in the foster care system? Because you are, it's not your child to raise and you are still taking on the same um, responsibilities, but no, that is that is how kinship care is when it's through the state system. Some grandparents are like, well, for that little three hundred eighty dollars, I might as well stay out of the system, and I'm just gonna take my grandchild in my house, and that can happen. But um, they get that stipend. Um, yeah, some say it's about the maximum they're gonna get is about four hundred six dollars a month. 
per child. But that's really not a lot of money. And not that they're in it for the money. I'm just pointing out the fact that in Texas, when it comes to kinship care, that's how it works. Um, but just looking in, that's just a little about that side of grandparenting. When I begin to think, you know, what is the role of a grandparent? <laughs> Most parents will tell you that, oh, they get away with stuff I never could get away with. So, you know, just on the funny side, one of the roles of a grandparent is to spoil that child. You know, in a perfect situation where the child is going home and they're not the one having to take care of it. Oh, yeah. They get to do everything at the grandparents' house. And those grandparents who are raising grandparents don't get the option to just be the grandparent who spoils a child because they're going to send them home because they are the parent. And they lose that um, ability. The other, another thing I thought, and this was just my list where at the last minute I was unable to have my guest on. I thought, well, let's just go for it. Uh, another thing was support the parent, you know, in, and this is like in the perfect world, which we know there is not a perfect world. But another thing a grandparent can do is to support the parent. Uh, being able to be that, um, just be their back, back up. As I said, they're going to spoil the child, you know, um, Kids can get away with things with the grandparent that the parent never could. And they're like, really? You let them do that? Um, my son and I were laughing not too long ago about the fact that he had a shelf for a snack food. When he and my dad would go shopping at the grocery store, everything that was not at my house, such as zebra cakes, um, the little bitty bottles of soda, um, those two I remember because oh, I just think they were horrible tasting and all the sugary snacks he wanted were always down there and he had a whole shelf just for snacks. Now we didn't get a shelf when I was a child. That same spot was not for us to have just sugary snacks. So there is that part of, um, but what makes that important is it allows a child to be special to someone outside of their home other than their parents. So when, you know, a positive spin on that grandparent being able to spoil and do those things, be it silly like buying sugary snacks that mom never would, it shows the child they can be special to someone, that you matter. And that is what I think is a bigger picture um, for grandparents, uh, grandparents being able to be in the grandparent role. To just be able to be that special someone and make that child feel special. Um, which my third point I thought about was being a guide. Um, I started this show by talking about the four little girls who were killed. And how we need to pass that part of our history on. History books aren't doing it. Our officially textbooks aren't doing it. So we have to. So it's up to the grandparent to be that person... Talk to your grandchild about what life was like when you were a child. If you're a grandparent, it's likely you didn't have internet when you were a child. You didn't have a cell phone when you were a child. We had pay phones that were, you know, strewn apart the city. So if something happened, you left home with that emergency quarter. So when you, um, if anything happened, um, you could call home. Now, everybody has a cell phone. Just keep it charged. So if anything happens, you can call home. Talk about just some of the differences, um, what it was like. I was laughing today with a friend, um, and we were had to change our location. We were going to eat, and all we had to do was go Google it. And I looked up black restaurants, black-owned restaurants near me. We found a place, went to eat, typed it in Google Maps, and we got there. Well, when we were young... That was not an option. You better know where you're going and know how you're going to get there. And just talk about the dip, even conversations about um, what would seem really challenging now was the norm. But having funny conversations, do your children know, your grandchildren, our children know what kind of issues around racism you experienced? You know, not just honoring grandparents, but as elders. Maybe you don't have grandchildren, but maybe you're around other children. Maybe you're around other young adults. And you can tell them, what, again, what life was like. 
When my parents moved into their home, they were the first blacks on the block. I don't know enough about that. And I think about the things I didn't ask. Um, but they found a home they wanted and they went for it. But find out, you know, being able to find out about what it was like to integrate a neighborhood, if that was your story, or find out what it was like, um, again, this is actually even before my time uh, of real remembrance. Um, each neighborhood, and I can speak for knowing about Dallas, knowing about places I've lived anyway, Kansas City, uh, knowing about Houston, of course, each one had that those cities, and I know it's true for many places, but I, you know, been to these places where, when there were just, and there's segregated neighborhoods, we supported each other, we shopped with each other, we spent our money with each other because that's all we had. So in Houston, there was um, Dowling Street and Jensen Street in Third Ward, Fifth Ward, and they were lined with stores. After integration came in. That was gone because we could go to the other side of town to shop and we wanted to and we did. And then we lost that. Uh, but in different store, in different cities, there was at those places and they were large in terms of where we could go and how we could spend our money. If you're an elder, share those stories of how we did that so that. Um, even the young people could know that that's real. That's a norm. That's why we want to spend other, why we want to spend our money with other African Americans because we have to generate our own wealth. Talk about wealth building. Whether you have wealth or not, you can talk about. Um, you can teach them the things you didn't know about building wealth. You can teach them about saving now, but just those little things. Teaching them the history. Teaching them the practical things sharing your family history and young children will um probably be like we were when we were young i can my grandmother my paternal grandmother could tell you the history of our family from when they arrived on a boat in virginia and moved up to um ohio i remember the fine points and they didn't take too well to uh you know being treated badly and one of them might have accidentally killed a white person, and that's how I ended up down here in Texas because they had to leave Ohio. Um, but and knowing that um, having a, a relative who was a first black postmaster in the state of Texas, in a very small town, knowing the history like that, letting them know what is your family history, how much of your family history do you know, share it. And even if it's not your own grandchild, if it's a child you mentor, a child in your life, if you're sharing the story and making history real, it can ignite a passion for history. We are left out of the history books that they study in school. They don't get it because they don't see it. It is purposeful. So we can share our personal histories, make it a point to share our personal histories with other younger people with children. There are young adults who don't know. You know, I was talking to someone the other day about us sharing our history, and I said the problem is we're now two generations out of people not knowing our history, not knowing about the bombing in, the, in 1963 of the 16th Street Baptist Church, not understanding why the civil rights movement was so important, not understanding why voting was so important. So when we as elders, we have to share that. I feel like we're obligated to share it. Um, there's this whole thing about intergenerational transfer. And I and we could talk about transfer of wealth, but we have to also practice that intergenerational transfer of wisdom. Be able to sit down and talk. Just talk. The walls that we have, um, between ourselves and our children are really artificial. You know, there's always been, when I was young, it was the generation gap, they called it. But, you know, when you just sit down and talk person to person, I want to connect with you. I am because you are, you are because I am. When you want to connect with somebody, you can do that. So find that one young person, your grandchild, your grandchildren, 
and just talk. See where their world is. Their world is very different, but every generation has been that way. Your world was very different from your parents' world. Your children and grandchildren, their world is very different. If, like I said, if you're a grandparent, it's likely you didn't have um, internet when you were growing up. Unless you're a very young grandparent, and there are some. And even then, internet wasn't as prevalent in your life as it was for these kids. For very young kids, it's always been there. Cell phones have always been there. I remember life before cell phone. And to them, that is just funny. It's hilarious. Um, but be able to just sit down and talk and not judge their world. It is very different. Now, some of their music, you're not going to want to listen to. You listen to words and it's like, do you know what they're talking about? Yeah, whatever. But be able to talk rather than just, I think there's horrible music you're listening to. I can't believe they're talking about this, this, and that. Have a conversation about just about it. Just talk about what is, this is why I think, this is why that appalls me. And then they can go back and listen to some of the music of your day. It wasn't all nice, nicey nice either. Well, they're back from my generation being young. Go back and listen to some Teddy Pendergrass. Mm -hmm. I can think of some songs that, you know, if we were judging our, judging our music by the same standard we want to judge um, our kids' music by, it wouldn't cut it either. So be willing to um, just talk. Enter their world. Last week, we talked about voting. A lot of young people don't want to vote or they're apathetic to it. And one of the first things we wanted to say was people died for your right to vote. And that is very true. But if I'm disconnected from it, it doesn't. I know I'm so glad they did. I'm glad people could do it. It just don't fit me. What conversations can you begin to have rather than just be angry with that response? What conversations can you have to bring it present? To just say that people died 50 years ago so you have the right to vote obviously isn't connecting because maybe we haven't done enough to connect history and bring that history alive. So what kind of conversations can you engage in so that um, your young folk will want to uh, vote, want to engage in the political process because you've made it real? So when I think about the relationship between elders and children or young adults or young children. It's about that connection. How can we connect more? What can we do? And yeah, I'm putting a lot of onus on the elders. Well, they need to come to me. And if they're not, then nothing happens. Um, and the other thing, and this is sometimes not a popular view, when we look at what's been going on with our children, I say we, my generation, the generation before, and a generation after, we have failed our children in a lot of ways. Coming out of integration in the 60s, we wanted to give our kids everything we didn't have, and every parent wants to do that in every generation. You should want your child's world to be better than yours was, so we want to give them more. We want them to have more than we had, but in Letting them have more, in some cases, we haven't given them enough responsibility. They just got more. And they got more stuff, more things, but not more responsibility. When we look at the violence we see in our world, we look at the callousness we see. So many things can lead to that. What's our role in allowing that to happen? They inherited the world we gave them. What world did we give them? Did we not teach enough in wanting it to be better? Did we not hold on to enough and allow them to struggle a little bit? Uh, again, if you give somebody everything, you don't appreciate it. There's uh, a now, always the analogy of a butterfly who's in a cocoon. When that butterfly is in that cocoon, they have to fight their way out. They work their way slowly out of the cocoon. If you were to just cut it so the butterfly could fly out, it wouldn't be able to. It is as the butterfly is 
working its way out of a cocoon, you know, step by step by step, that its wings are getting stronger because of the fight. The wings are getting stronger because it has to work its way out. Have we allowed our young people to work enough on so many levels? I mean, even on a practical level, I know parents uh, in working and doing what I do who don't think young children should have chores around the house. Mm -hmm. Whatever, whether you call them chores or not, you call them responsibilities, you call them jobs, whatever you call them, they're parents who don't think they need that at all. No, well, I wait till they get older. They need to just be a kid. Hmm. Um, why not? Why not? I would say, why not? Why not let them just learn? That butterfly had to struggle, had to work to be strong. Maybe in allowing them to have so much, we haven't given our children and our young people um, the ability to just be strong. We can talk about, man, they can't take anything. They had this and that, that. Well, maybe they haven't had the opportunity to work to be strong. So as the elders, it's our time. Now, if you're sharing this with somebody young, let me turn the tables around. All right, as someone young, it's time to listen. You don't know everything. We don't know everything. In every generation, young people think they know more than their elders. And in every generation, guess what? You don't. You may know more about things that are in your world. You're going to be more tech savvy than your grandparents. You're going to know more about um, social media. You're going to know more how to just do get on TikTok. You're going to know how to do all this. You're going to know how to connect. You're going to know how to, you can be the one when the grandparent or just a, or an elder you know gets a new TV and they can't figure out how to work. You can go to a young person, they'll tell you. They may have never seen that TV before, that brand, that model, or anything. You give them one minute, they can tell you, oh, here's how you work your complicated remote. So young people, it's up to you to be patient with the elders. It's up to you to want to listen and understand that your history is important. It's important for you to learn your history. And you know what? Since you're not going to get it in a textbook, who can you best get it from? The old people around you who lived it the old people around you who had history in their schools when they were young, the old people around you who um, were forced to learn history, the old people around you who love their history. So it's both sides. We both have to give up a little something. We both have both sides, the old and the young, to work on what I call that intergenerational transfer of wisdom. And we, and we, as the elders, can uh, understand that we can learn from them as well. If it's no more than learning how to use your technology, um, we can learn. I can remember another personal story. <clears throat> my younger sister was visiting Houston. And my son was eight at the time. And she had a new cell phone. She didn't know how to work it. I said, well, give it to him. He'll, he'll show you. He is not going to know anything about cell phones. And this is before everybody had one. He didn't even have one then. I said, give it to him. He'll, he'll tell you what to do. She was, oh, uh, and we couldn't get to the cell phone store. It was too late. I said, just give him a try, knowing that, yeah, even then, they were tech savvy. Oh, yeah, Auntie Nita, you do da 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 And it was fine. So being willing as the elder to listen to the younger person and the younger person being willing to say so without attitude. Just be there. Be there with them, be there for them. Let's have those conversations. Just sit down and talk. And you know what? It can be talking about nothing. It might be playing a game. Um, I have run across so many young people who still do love board games. Can play a mean game of Monopoly. Um, and all these, uh, many other ones, that's just one that comes to mind. But being able to just hang out, it doesn't even have to be serious. So when when we look at elders and when we look at 
young adults, children, let's just come together. When you think about our mental health, so many of our, um, our younger and younger children are, are having mental health issues, anxiety, depression, suicide, attempting suicide, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, we're seeing it younger and younger. Um, I just wonder if we go back to being more family oriented, spending time, can some of that be averted? Now, some of the anxiety and depression is coming from abuse, coming from trauma. Some is just coming from poor coping skills. So if we are, as the elders, are working with the younger generation more, maybe we can help them get some coping skills. Our coping skills were different. I'm not going to say better or worse, but different. But our, once again, our world was different. Uh, if you look at grandparents um, or my parents' age, they had to deal with segregation. You had to have a whole different kind of tolerance to manage that. And then when they decided, you know, it was time for a change, you had to have a whole different kind of um, tolerance to manage going through the civil rights era just to get things to where they were, where they are rather now. So can we sit down and just talk about it, be tolerant with each other? Um, so those are just some thoughts about uh, honoring our elders and really switched it around and let our elders, it's our world time to take um, the title seriously. Now it's true, in many circles we talk about being an elder is more than just age. You can live old and not be, you can live to be 80 and not be an elder in terms of that sage, wisdom, sage uh, wise one who needs to pass it on. But I encourage you all, if you've got some age to you, Share the good things, bad things, and different things that you've learned. Listen to them. And young people, you do the same. Listen, share what you've learned. Not just technology. You have lessons in life you've learned. Let it be two ways. But have fun together. Just be able to be with um, different generations and have fun. Just hanging out. It's, it's, um, and you find you have more in common than not in common. Um, I wanted to, uh, there are some things I wanted to do near the end anyway, and we're getting close. And as I said, our guests didn't come and there were just some things when I thought at the last minute, well, let's just talk about the relationship between elders and, uh, young people. I talked in the very beginning about voting and the importance of passing that on. I will end every show between now and October 11th with this. The last day to register to vote in the state of Texas, I can only speak for the state of Texas, uh, is October 11th. In the state of Texas, your name could have been purged from the rolls and you don't know it. If you haven't voted for three years, you're gone. You may say, okay, I, I want to vote again. You're gone. If uh, there could be other things you don't know, if you moved, if something happened and you didn't correctly change your address, you could be gone from the rolls. So I want to encourage everyone to go and check your voter status. Even if you voted in the last election and everything was good. So I plan to check mine because I do want to practice what I preach. Check your voting voter status and see are you valid? Are you registered to vote? Make sure. After you have registered, become an educated voter. You can go to vote411.org, the League of Women Voters.org, and pretty soon your ballot will be coming up. You put in your zip code and your exact ballot that you will see will come up. You have the option, the opportunity to read about every person in every race. If a ballot has, um, um, not it's not just a person, I, the word is, I've lost the word for it, but uh, propositions, every propositions will be there. And then they take the proposition and put it in plain language. So be that educated voter, 
check your voter registration. It is imperative that you do that. I will say that every week I will take time out at the end to talk about how important that is. If you are the elder listening in, the grandparent, take your elder status, your grandparent status, and wear it like a badge of honor. And as you wear it like a badge of honor, treat it like a badge of honor. And go out and share with young people. Just spend time with them. Hang out with your grandchildren. Um, if you're the grandparent raising grandchildren, that's a hard situation to be in um, because it probably wasn't your choice to just jump into that. There are, are organizations that support you, that provide support to grandparents raising grandparents. You are not alone. Um, if you Google grandparents raising grandparents, one of the organizations is sponsored by uh, AARP and the person who was going to come on was going to talk about her partnership with her organization by, with the AARP. But there are ways to get help. You are not alone. Get help. Um, there are hundreds, thousands of grandparents raising grandchildren and there are thousands that are struggling. So if that's, if you are that person, seek help. You can, if you're watching this on Facebook, message me. Uh, to Black Mental Health is Black Health. And we will um, get some of that information to you. We're never alone in this world and don't have to be. So reach out and get the help that's there. Um, we're going to end a little early tonight. As I said, my guests had technical difficulties, but I wanted to still, as I say, the show must go on. So I wanted to talk about those important issues of that inner generational transfer of wisdom. So be, if you're the elder, pass on the wisdom. If you're the younger, listen. And on both sides, let's not just listen with our ears, but listen with our heart. Hear the heart of one another. And not just even across generations. Hear the heart of each other in the same generation. Let us do that. So we'll end about um, seven minutes early. I thank you for joining in tonight. Black mental health is black health and everything we do impacts our mental health. I'm Bronwyn Lucas, the caring counselor here to help you. If you are in need of um, mental health help, reach out. I may not be the therapist for you. I would love to help you, but if you find I'm not the one and just need help finding a therapist, reach out. I will help you do that. Um, so I look forward to seeing you guys next week, and I will see you then, and thanks again for joining. If you're watching this, share it. Hit that share button um, so others can just hear some thoughts about elders and young people. See you next week.